2 Corinthians chapter 9, I want to read, uh, beginning with verse 10, and we're going to look primarily just at one verse, but to get a context, um, we'll look at 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 9, and let me pick up reading with verse 6. It gives a better context. <clears throat> but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have an all-sufficiency in all things, have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteous remains forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. When you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayers for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. May the Lord's rich blessing be to his red word. May it be sanctified in our hearts. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word. For the instance of your word gives light. And I pray, oh, Father, that you would speak a good word to us today. That our spirits might be lifted as we encounter the living Lord Jesus Christ. And as, as, as his spirit continues to fill us and to anoint us, to warm our hearts, and to remind us of your great love for us. Speak to your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord, and I want to speak this morning, focusing on that one verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable or indescribable gift. How many of you are familiar with the name Gabby Douglas? How many of you? All right. We got to go back in time. There are some things we used to not miss in this country, uh, particularly within our community, because when one did well, there was a sense that we all were vicariously doing well. And we were all being lifted by the success uh, of the one. Now, if you did not see the performance of little Miss Gabby Douglas from down in Virginia Beach, Norfolk area, who at the tender age, I believe, of like 16 years of age, uh, became the all-around gymnastic champion of the whole world, of the whole world, a little African-American girl who left home to go out to live out an hour uh, so she could train and get the best training. And when she started out, no one gave her a real chance. She wasn't polished. She hadn't had all the training that some of the other young women in this country received, but her performance was absolutely spectacular, and everybody ought to see it. You ought to see it. Everybody ought to watch it. You ought to get your kids, your grandkids, <laughs> your kids, your grandkids, the dog, the cats, whatever you get. Everybody. That's what we used to do, you know. We'd bring everybody in so everybody could see this for themselves, and we could be witnesses, not only to history being made, but to a young girl who handled all the pressure and the nerves that's associated with competing at that level. And we saw athletes that just couldn't handle that type of pressure, but her performance was almost flawless. And as she was uh, talking to one of the reporters, she said something that was really caught my attention. She said that my mother told me that, that I could inspire people. And, uh, and she said, I want to inspire people. And she did have indeed inspired a lot of people as they watched her performance, watched her, saw her mother and her family, and just watched this incredible performance. 
you ought to watch it because it was indeed spectacular. The Olympic Games provides a good diversion away from silly season. You see, we're like less than 100 days away from the election. This is just crazy, silly, stupid season. We become the big idiots on the face of the planet to spend multi-million dollars on the elections. I mean, just to do, say crazy stuff that people know is not true, uh, just absolutely silly stuff. And what ends up happening, we end up really becoming divided and we become polarized. Now, I heard an interesting commentary yesterday by an author that's reached a, uh, recently released a book dealing with the power of the internet to shape public opinion. And he says, what the internet provides is an opportunity for people to select the information that they read, and they will select narrow information that just reinforces their predisposed opinion. And therefore, people just start to select stuff that kind of fuels their own ideology, and they're not even exposing themselves to the other side of the other view. Therefore, they become more narrow and more myopic and very strident and more very militant in defending their position when their position simply doesn't have all of the facts. Neither political party has a monopoly on the truth, y'all. And both of them sort of dabble in the gray areas of mistruths and half-truths. And so we find ourselves greatly polarized as a nation. And the whole concept and the whole idea of a democratic republic where the people have the opportunity to participate in the electoral process to select those who will lead and will provide the direction for the government, sewn into that is an adversarial position. And so both parties have to try to convince you to be upset with the other party. And so by design, we have been programmed to be upset, uh, discontented, frustrated over things that are far beyond our control. And if we're not careful as Christian people, see, we'll get caught up in all of that. We'll get caught up in all the hoopla. Yes, we're the register to vote. You know, I certainly strongly believe in people registering and vote to vote and exercising the right of enfranchisement, that's really important because in a democratic republic, you have a situation where when the people fear the politicians, you end up with tyranny. See, in a republic, the politician is supposed to fear the people because the power is supposed to rest and to reside with the people to elect those who they want to lead and to then to retire those who they think have mismanaged that responsibility. But when we start fearing the electoral process and fearing the politicians, we got a problem on our hands. But in the midst of all of this, we must not get caught up in all of the divisiveness because if there's one thing that's needed, there is a need for there to be the voices of reason trying to reconcile the polarizing views and trying to get people to understand we may have came over on different ships, but we're in the same boat now. The $15 trillion, $16 trillion debt is our debt. We're going to have to pay taxes to pay this thing down. It's on our shoulders. The Republicans are not going to pay it, or the Democrats, we're going to pay it together. You see what they're trying to do? They're even trying to tax the Olympic gold medals. You know we bad. We're in bad shape. Most people didn't even realize that. They're trying to tax the people on them. If you want a gold medal, they want to tax you almost $9,000 because they get it 25,000 winning a gold, I think, 15,000 winning a silver, and I believe it's 5,000 winning a bronze. When the people lose, they ain't crying because they lost y'all. They crying because they're not going to get the check. So the United States government, the IRS, figured this out. We don't care where you run and where you win the medal at when you come back. We just want piece of the check. And so now a a congresswoman has introduced legislation that would, uh, would, that would result in the earnings for the gold, silver, and the bronze would be taxed. That's how bad our country is. We want a piece of every dollar that's generated anywhere we can get it because the debt is so enormous. And it's a debt that we share collectively as a country. Now, in the midst of all of that, we must not lose sight of the fact that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And we must not allow ourselves to be drug into all of the mud slinging in the political process. We must not allow ourselves to be drugged down basically to the lowest common denominator in all of the rancor and all the name calling and all the devices. We are Christian folk. 
We're the people of God, the continuation of the life of Jesus Christ. We are the voice of reason, and we're trying to reconcile these polarized views to help people realize we've got to work together. We've got to work together to try to advance our schools, advance our neighborhoods, our communities, advance our state, and by the grace of God to advance our nation. If ever there was a time for a voice of reason and a reconciling voice, that voice is needed now. Never in the history of this country had this country been so polarized around political ideology than it is today. And that's why it's so important for the church to be the church and to not take political sides because Jesus Christ is not coming back on a donkey or an elephant. He's not coming back to usher in some political movement. He's coming back to take over the whole show and bring the kingdom of God. So our concern should be about advancing God's kingdom, God's truth, God's righteousness, God's word, and lift up the name of Jesus because it doesn't matter who sits in the White House, they got a mess on their hands. A huge, huge dilemma on their hand. And they need the church to be praying and being solid citizens and trying to get our children, our grandchildren to be solid citizens and be contributors to solving problems, not just creating more divisiveness and more rancor. Well, with that as a backdrop, the Olympics serves as a good diversion to us to celebrate the greatness of this great republic. And so those, those athletes, they compete there as citizens of the United States of America, and they do it with great dignity and great pride and great grace, and we all should stand a little bit taller to know that we're still producing those type of young men and young women that can go clear across the world and represent us well and reflect back on our country in a very, very positive, positive way. And so it provides us with a diversion to see the possibility of what can happen when we realize we really are connected together, we're bound together, and that we have a common destiny that we share. With that as the backdrop, I want us to be reminded during this political season, during this time of tremendous divisiveness, mudslinging, rancor, name calling, that we're the church. And God has given us a great, great gift. And I say it often, we are the custodians of the sacred secrets of the scripture, the Bible. And we're to be lifting up God's truth and trying to point people toward our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which is the only hope of salvation. There are things, some things that we need to remember. And on this first Sunday of August, this communion Sunday, as we will observe the Lord's table and we'll be reminded of God's great sacrificial gift on our behalf, and we ought to focus just a little bit on this whole idea of God's unspeakable, God's indescribable gift to us in the person of his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm sure that Miss uh, Gabby Douglas's mother feel a tremendous sense of blessing that God had entrusted to her, that little girl, to raise up and to train up. Now, the truth of the matter is the whole story is not being told. Now, the father, he hadn't been a deadbeat. Now, this is a soldier guy, ladies and gentlemen. Anybody talking about him? He ain't abandoned the family, lead the family. He's been over in Afghanistan two or three times. And he'd been taking care of his business back home. He and the, the, the mother are probably going to divorce, but they're acting like there hadn't been no daddy nowhere around, didn't even care. This is a single woman raising her children all by herself. That's just the way they want to put it out. That ain't the truth. And I'm hoping that Oprah Winfrey or somebody come and tell the whole truth about this situation because they ought to have had the camera over in Afghanistan showing the brother cheering for his daughter also. Come on now, give the brother some credit here now. And I'm sure he's standing a bit tall himself, realizing that God did give to them a precious gift. But God has given us this great gift. He's given us the unspeakable gift of a son. John says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This unspeakable gift of a son, Isaiah talks about unto us a child is born, a son is given. So God has given the unspeakable gift of his son, his love, his cherished, his nurtured son, he's given to us. And we ought to be reminded of that, that God has given to us the very best that heaven had to offer to us. And that should be the motivator for us to want to live in a way that will be honoring to the Lord. Us want to treat people in a way that reflect the fact we believe they are created in the image of God. Because we're reminded of God's unspeakable, indescribable gift of his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on our behalf. Not only did he give to us this unspeakable, 
indescribable gift of his only begotten son, but he's given his son to us as this unspeakable, indescribable substitute. Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He says, for, for God has made him Christ to become sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We sometimes trivialize the transaction of salvation. We think it's a trivial thing that we just say a few words and say, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and that he was buried and raised from the dead on the third day and I trust him as my personal savior. And yes, salvation is just that simple. The transaction can happen just that simply when we by faith trust Jesus Christ. But it's not a trivial thing for Christ to become the substitute. He had to become sin. He literally had to bear the, the punishment, the shame, and the guilt for the whole world. He became the substitute. He stood in our place. He has borne our shame, our guilt, our stain, our humiliation. It's a great price that was paid for him to be the substitute. Now, we have a few people this morning that are educators, and there are some schools, when the, the teachers use up all their sick days, or most of their sick days, in some schools, and when the teachers are absent from those schools, it's hard to get substitutes. <laughs> there are some places that people just don't want to go to teach because they know the children there are better than Bonnie and Clyde, better than Al Capone, better than, I watched a piece the other day. One of the two most intriguing people has been some of the, the fugitives and the criminals that we have created. If you want to see some interesting guys, you've you, you got to read about John Dillinger. You've got to read about Machine Gun Kelly. You've got to read something about Babyface Nelson. The FBI came to try to arrest Babyface Nelson. Babyface Nelson got out of his car, shot down about eight or nine FBI agents, 17 bullets in his body. He just refused to die until he took out the last one. And then he went and died, and his girlfriend, who loved him dearly, put him in a ditch and covered him up with a, with a, with a, with a coat and said, because he, he, he gets cold all the time. These were some people that if someone could have harnessed all of the determination and resolve that they had, they could have been incredible citizens of this great republic. But someone they took a wrong turn. And so you know why I work with children as best I can and encourage people to work with kids the best I can? Because we got some baby face Nelson and Machine Gun Kelly and John Dillinger and Bonnie Clyde in our neighborhood I'm trying to tell y'all. They just little people right now. And the last thing you want is for them to be armed and not be in the military. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? And so we got to reach them while we're young and we can get them turned around and get them on the Lord's side and channel all of that passion and energy and intelligence and daring and risk-taking for great things and for spiritual things. They can turn the world upside down. So God has given us his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, this, the great substitute. He is born the punishment and the shame. And so therefore we can be delivered. You see, sometimes we don't fully explore and explain the depth, the gravity, and the magnitude of the gospel. And so we talk to people about being saved and about going to heaven, and we talk to them about being saved and about escaping hell, but we don't talk to them about the benefit of knowing Jesus Christ now, of having shame and guilt and humiliation dealt with and handled, about having a conscience that is clear and that is clean. People are basically being harassed by their past failures. They've been held hostage by their own shame and their guilt. And they can't see no way to ever deliver themselves from it or to be detangled from it. And so the gospel of Jesus Christ is not just about escaping hell and going to heaven. It is about being delivered from darkness now and here. And that's why our testimonies are so important. Our testimonies are so important because our testimony speaks to the relevance of God. That God is a contemporary God. He is a right now God. He's a God that is involved in the daily affairs of people, helping people to maintain their sanity and helping people not be derailed by their failures. And so this idea of him being our substitute. He stood in our place. 
He's already bore the punishment that we deserve so we can step into the light and live the lives that we desire to live knowing that God has already dealt with the sticky stuff and the icky stuff and the stuff that really makes us feel ashamed and disgraceful. Jesus Christ has already dealt that with that. He's already been our substitute. Oh, I wish y'all could help me today, but I know y'all got chicken sandwiches and fish sandwiches and ribs on your mind at Multifest, so I'm going to hurry up and get on out the way because I know not to stand in the way of a rib sandwich. <laughs> Preacher can't win on that one. Unspeakable gift of a son. Unspeakable gift of a substitute who became sin for us. An unspeakable gift of a sacrifice. Paul talks about in Romans 5, 8 that God has commended, God has demonstrated, God has shown his love for us, and that while we were yet enemies of God, we were sinners against God, Christ has died for us. And Paul says, that is a great anomaly, because I can't find somebody would die for good people, even righteous folk, Paul said. And Paul, knowing the serpents that crawled on the floor of his own soul, that Paul was always totally blown away by how magnanimous the grace of God was. And he tried to use vivid terms to describe it. You are enemies against God. You are hostile against God. And Ephesians said you are targets for God's bullseye. You are by nature the children of wrath, deserving of going to hell, but God who is rich in mercy that he has toward us. He came the sacrifice. The sacrifice, the, the quintessential sacrifice, the, the perfect sacrifice, the only sacrifice that could appease and could satisfy the wrath and the anger of a holy and a righteous God. This is an unspeakable gift, an indescribable gift. This is what motivates you when your soul is teetering between sanity and insanity. This is what motivates you when you find yourself going to drift into discouragement and depression and discontentment when you realize that God has been my substitute and my sacrifice, there's a reason for me to live because no matter what I have to face in this world, I will not have to face hell in the world to come. But what if I face it in this world? I don't face it by myself. Or I don't walk alone. We got to understand this idea of the eminence of God, of the, of the presence of God. We never walk alone. We never deal with a situation by ourselves. We never encounter the death of a loved one and have to grieve all by ourselves. We're never dealing with a wayward child that there isn't a God that understands all about that situation and is able to give us the grace we need to deal with that and not lose our mind and not lose hope. We never face, we never face the disappointment of financial failure and even bankruptcy without God being there to remind us that a man or a woman's life consists more than the abundance of the things that he or she possesses. So we're reminded of this indescribable, unspeakable gift that God has given to us in his son who became our substitute and our sacrifice. And this is all interrelated because he's also the unspeakable gift of a sin bearer. A sin bearer. How many of you are familiar with the term scapegoat? None of the young people raise their hand. None of the young people know what, know what they're talking about. We, we use terms now, and we don't realize we need a dictionary and a thesaurus. So we need something to explain to the young people what we're talking about. But you older folk, you know what a scapegoat is. I mean, a scapegoat is someone that takes the blame, someone that we kind of pass the buck on them. But what a lot of older people don't realize, that the scapegoat is biblical. And the term scapegoat comes from the Bible. And literally what they would have to do is they would come together, bring all the people together. And the high priest, he would confess the people's sins. He would confess his own sins. And he would take his hand and he would lay his hands on the head of a goat. And he was transferring the guilt of his sin, of the people's sins, when transferred from them onto the goat. And then the goat was led out and abandoned in the wilderness. All by himself. Jesus became our scapegoat. That's why on the cross of Calvary, when he's hung between heaven and the earth, with his blood dripping out of his body, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
Because on the cross of Calvary, when the full fury, the anger of God's wrath was unleashed upon Jesus Christ, he became the sin bearer, and in bearing the sins of the whole world, he literally became on that cross the scapegoat. And he had to die all by himself, the loneliness all by himself, not even experiencing the fellowship of the Father and the Holy Spirit. As the Son of God and his sin bearer, he had to die all by himself alone and be the scapegoat. That's why we come to this table, ladies and gentlemen. This is something that should call our hearts to rejoice. We come with reverence. We come with a sense of awe and a sense of humility. We come to this table also with a sense of joy. We know that a son has been given. He became our substitute and our sacrifice, but he also has become our sin bearer and our scapegoat. So it doesn't matter what people say about me. It doesn't matter what they try to resurrect from my past or from your past, even if it's true. Jesus Christ has already had the punishment for that to be placed upon him, and he's already taken it into the wilderness, and he will never allow the goat to come back to the camp. Oh, I wish I could get some help. So a son has been given. A substitute has been given. Unspeakable gift indescribable gift, a sacrifice has been offered, a sin bearer has bore our sins, cast them into the sea of forgetfulness, posted a sign that says no fishing, they might be remembered no more. And then finally, we have the unspeakable, indescribable gift of a Savior, of a Savior. A one that delivers us out of the darkness, translates us into the kingdom of light and the kingdom of his dear son. We have a savior. We have a champion, an archegos, a one that has went before us, who has blazed the trail before us. That's why Jesus said to the disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there ye shall be also. We have a Savior who is a trailblazer. He's already walked the path before us. He's already blazed the path before us. And so when we have to walk down the path of the valley of the shadow of death, we have a Savior who's already walked that path before us to make sure that there was a clear passage to the other side, to make sure we make it to the other side. We have a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ the Lord, Jesus of Nazareth, and he lives. He lives, and because he lives, we live, and we shall live, and there's no weapon that is formed against us that will prosper. We have a Savior. We have an indescribable unspeakable gift that has been given to us, not for us to get in the future. We will receive an inheritance in the future, but we have the present gift of the presence of God, the anointing of God, the spirit of the living God living inside of us, reminding us that we are his and he are ours, and we never walk alone. And so Paul wrote these words to the Corinthian church. And I'll read them one more time in your hearing. If you read chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians in its context, what you find that Paul is talking about something in the church we don't like for the preacher to talk about it. What is that? Tithes and offerings? <laughs> He's talking about the money. The whole ninth chapter of, 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 of 2 Corinthians and most of the eighth chapter, Paul is talking about the money because Paul is concerned about the poor saints in Jerusalem. And so Paul is taking up offerings from the church in Europe that were more affluent and had more resources because they hadn't experienced the persecution as the Christians in Jerusalem. So Paul is taking up offering and taking up money from these Christian folk. And that's why he says to them in chapter 6, he said, now if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. If you pinch with God and you take a little bit off and you pinch a little bit off with God, you remember when you were kids like that? I remember we're like that. You know, you, you go down, we have this little store called Mr. Pearl's. Mr. Pearl was a little old store, had just about anything you wanted to have if you didn't want much. But, of course, you could buy a cookie for a penny. 
one cookie. You got a penny, you can buy one cookie. Mr. Pearl would put his dirty hand down in the cookie bowl and pull you out a cookie. You give him a penny, he give you the cookie. One, you could go to Mr. Pearl and you could buy a quarter, a quarter worth of pepperoni. And he'd grab the pepperoni stick out. He had that old cutting thing went back and forth. He'd cut you off a quarter's worth of pepperoni. You could buy four slices of bologna. He'd take the bologna thing out. You could get four slices of bologna for a quarter. Just about anything you wanted, Mr. Pearl. You could get it. And so as kids, we would go around looking for pop bottles. What kid today would go around looking for pop bottles? Back then, you know, the milk people, there was a milk guy. He delivered the milk in glass containers, right? And so there was a deposit on the quarter, uh, on the quart of milk or the half gallon or the gallon. So we would find milk containers, people throwing away glass milk containers, pop bottles, you get two cents for a pop bottle. You could even get a penny for, the, for those fall staff beer things. Those long, y'all know about that fall staff. I don't think they ain't sell it no more, but even beer bottles. You see, you, we recycle for real back then. Glass bottles, you could get a penny. And so we would go and we got, I, I used to like a, a big time. Who are those big time men? You buy a big time, right? You're a big time candy bar. You could buy a, Mr. a payday. You could buy Hollywood, right? Or you could buy a zero. Y'all don't know nothing about that. Y'all there in the city. But up there, you had a zero, Hollywood, big time, Fifth Avenue. Only cost a nickel. Get them for a nickel. Right now, you pay about a dollar. Same size. You pay a dollar. Get them for a nickel. You can get a 16 ounce of a double cola. You know what a double cola is? A double cola is like drinking corn alcohol. It will burn your throat. <laughs> It was so much acid and stuff in a double cola, but you could get it for a dime. 16 ounces of double cola. And so, you know, we're all hustling around. We're hustling around. You go in the store, and, and you try to sneak in the store when your buddies wasn't looking because if you didn't, when you came out, there they standing on the piece of this or piece of that. So you come out, and you got a big time or Hollywood or Fifth Avenue. Brother Griggs don't know what I'm talking about. Him and Belinda, they don't tell the truth. They used to go to Mr. Pearl's, too, and Fred McClain's store. They don't know what I'm talking about. So you come out the store, everybody on the piece, and so you kind of pinch it off a piece. <laughs> you pinch it off a piece. And then what, what, what the real smart guys would do, they would come out and open that can up and say, ah, call Tony. <laughs> that was the way to try to keep somebody from asking you for some of it. But you, you would pinch off a piece. But you had to be real careful when you're dealing with your cut buddies because you know that if you were stingy with your cut buddies, there was going to come a time you were going to need your cut buddies. So you always try to make sure that you gave your cut buddies a bigger piece of whatever you had. So all Paul is saying is you want to penny pinch with God, then go ahead and penny pinch with God. But God really is your cut buddy, and you're going to need him. And there's a time you're going to need God, and you're going to penny pinch with God, but you're going to want God to give you the whole thing. He says, so don't penny pinch with God. Give sparingly with God. Give as much as you can with God. Sacrifice in your giving to God because when you do that, you're investing with him, and you're showing that you're a laborer together with him. So Paul goes this whole narrative about giving, and what he does, like any good Baptist preacher does, he saves his hoop for the last. He says, now you giving to God, but thanks be to God, for his indescribable, unspeakable gift. There's nothing you could ever give to God would in any way amount to what God has already given to you. And so in your giving toward God, you're to be liberal with your time. Live her with your treasure. Live her with your talent. Do all you can in the name of the Lord and for the Lord because God has been good to you. Can I get a witness? Well, I would preach for a minute, but y'all got to go to Multifest. So I'm going to stop right there. I promise you I'll let you out early this week. But God is good to you. And testify and tell people how good God has been to you, how God has opened the door for you at your job, how God has made your budget balanced, but you know how you're going to make it, how God has did something for you physically and health-wise. You testify and you speak well of God. Don't wait till you die for someone to speak well of you. You ought to eulogize God now while you are alive. Speak well of him. Speak well of him. Speak well of him. <laughs> Represent him well. There's a little bit of controversy that has uh, sort of uh, become political because this, the, uh, a Navy SEAL has been very critical uh, of the president. And so they had to relieve him of his responsibility. And we can argue over this whole deal, but the president is the commanding chief. I mean, he kind of over the whole military show. You know that uh, that's the biggest part of his job. Of everything he's responsible, he's resp he is the commander and the chief over the Joint Chiefs of Staff, over all the generals, over the old military. He's over it all. And so there is a certain respect you've got to show the commander-in-chief. 
since he's over the whole show. And so these young athletes, they've been great ambassadors for us over in London. They've reflected well back on the whole United States of America. They've handled themselves so well. You know, in other parts of the world, they don't think a whole lot of us. They think we're we arrogant, we're selfish, we consume, we're narcissistic, we're, uh, we preoccupy with self. But they've been so humble when they get their medals and so humble when they talk to the press, you know, and they're carrying themselves so well. They reflect so well back on us. Well, we are God's ambassadors. And so everything that we do reflects back on God. People are coming to a conclusion about what type of God he is based on how they feel about us, how we encounter ourselves. So we want to be humble and we want to be kind and we want to be grateful. And we're going to be testifying about how wonderful God is, reflecting back on him in a positive way. So the people will conclude, well, they really do love their God. Amen? Well, thanks be to God for his un un unspeakable, inexpressible gift. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you for this another glorious opportunity to be together with your people. We thank you for the songs that have been sung today by our choir and how the congregation joined in, the prayers that's been offered by our assistant pastor, the worship and giving by the church.